Hey everybody, it's Matt. Welcome or welcome back to the Journey Church Podcast. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you can automatically get our weekly episodes. And you might want to go ahead and subscribe to our Journey YouTube channel as well. You'll find messages, music, interviews, inspiring stories, and more for you all right there. Now, I hope this episode helps you take your next step in following Jesus. Today, I want to start by asking you two questions, and these questions are a bit of an all play, okay? So it doesn't matter if you're a follower of Jesus or not a follower of Jesus. Uh, These questions apply to all of us, and I'm guessing all of us have pretty much the same answer. The first question is maybe the easiest question you'll ever be asked. Who do you think about most? Who do you think about most? Uh, You know what the answer to this is. The answer is you. You think about you the most, right? I think about me the most. Although I had a buddy stop me and say, hey, if my wife asks, I think about her the most. And I said, yeah, but we all know you're lying. Anyway, that's, that's just, it's just human nature, isn't it? Which is a bit awkward. If you're not a Christian, I'll admit this. It's a bit awkward for us Christians to admit this because, well, you know, Jesus said life's not about you. Life's not about me. That when you follow him, it's supposed to be about others. But if we're being honest, we think about ourselves more than we think about anybody else. We're a work in progress. We've got a long way to go. Which leads to the second question. It's, you probably haven't thought about this one, but who do you think about least? And the answer is pretty obvious. The people you think about least are the people least like you and farthest from you. That's just human nature, isn't it? The people that you're nothing like, you don't spend much time thinking about them. Uh, The people who you never interact with, you're never around, you don't spend much time thinking about them. The people you don't know, you don't ever sit and ponder, neither do I. Uh, Which is natural and it's normal. That's just human nature. However, it's the exact opposite of how our Heavenly Father thinks. It's the exact opposite of how... Jesus thinks, which means for those of us who do follow him, if we want to be more like Jesus, we have to figure out how to think more like Jesus, which means flipping the way that we think. And I'll come back to that thought in just a minute. Uh, We are in week two, if you missed last week or you're new around here, we're in week two of this series we've been in called This Is The Way. And the reason we named it that is because early on, uh, followers of Jesus were not known as Christians, which is odd to us because that's what everybody term everybody uses now but followers of Jesus back then were known as followers of the way and they were known by that and they were referred to as that because the distinguishing mark of these early Jesus followers was not a set of religious beliefs that they adhered to that they followed that they tried to teach people the distinguishing mark the thing that they were known for the thing that everybody talked about or thought about when they thought about Jesus followers in the first century is they thought about one these people believed that Jesus died on a Roman cross and then came back to life they believed in the resurrection and that was you know a brand new concept and a brand new idea for all of them we can talk about that another time and the thing they thought about was these people live a different way of life it was a way of life that Jesus had introduced to the world it's hard for us to wrap our heads around it, but it was so countercultural. It was so foreign. It was so brand new. Nobody throughout history had ever lived the way Jesus said we ought to live, and yet these early Jesus followers are trying to, to adopt this and to live this, and they faltered and had issues and struggles just like we do. They didn't always get it right, but that's what they were known for. I mean, they, they live with a, a level of forgiveness and compassion and generosity and selflessness and on and on and on we could go, you know, self-control. They live with these qualities that nobody else lives with. It was a brand new way, which is why they were called followers of the way, the way of Jesus. And that's what became their distinguishing characteristic or the distinguishing quality that separated them from everybody else in their culture. So what I told you last week is I said, we're going to spend this series talking about some of those core behaviors. I don't have time to cover them all, but I want to talk about four of them over the next four weeks. Four things that distinguished these early Jesus followers from everyone else around them. Four things that quite honestly should still be true of us if we're not just somebody who's a Christian, but we're actually following the way of Jesus. And so what I hope is I hope for those of us who are Christians, this will serve as a bit of an internal evaluation to figure out, okay, how well am I doing at that? And are there some areas where I need to let God help me grow uh, for our church as a whole? These are actually things that have been values and core to our church from the very beginning. This is what we've been shooting for. And again, we don't always get it right. We mess this up sometimes, but these are values that we always want to come back to and The extent to which we can do that collectively depends on how well all of us who are Christians do this individually, all of us who call ourselves part of this church, this movement we call Journey. So it's important for us to do it individually. And then if you're not a Christian, here's what I hope this does. I hope this actually paints a picture for you of what it should look like and could look like if you followed Jesus. And if those of us who call ourselves Christians better 
follow Jesus. And this gives you uh, two advantages. One, I, I hope it will entice you enough that you'll lean in and go, okay, well, if that's what it means to follow Jesus, I think I might want to be a part of that. And two, it lets you hold us accountable, which you know, nobody likes, but we need. It lets you hold us accountable. And when you see people who call themselves Christians not living in the way of Jesus, you can immediately go, whoa, whoa, whoa. This, this isn't a problem with God. This is a problem with the followers of God. You know, you can separate the two in your mind and go, okay, I know Jesus. This was his way. This is what he taught. They're just not living up to it. So today I'm going to introduce you to this first core behavior, and it's simply this. Followers of the way prioritize people far from God. Followers of the way prioritize. What do you mean by prioritize, Matt? I mean they care about, they value, and they prioritize people far from God above themselves and other Jesus followers, which, you know, this doesn't happen often, but whenever there is a, a tension, whenever there's an intersection, whenever there's a bit of an issue between what Christians want and what non-Christians want, what's best for a Christian, what's best for a non-Christian, followers of the way always prioritize the people who are not yet followers of Jesus, which is extremely difficult to do because the gravitational pull of every single one of us as individuals, the gravitational pull of every organization, certainly every church, is to focus inward. It's why I asked the question I asked at the beginning. Nobody needs to teach you to think about you. Nobody needs to teach you to consider you. Nobody needs to teach you. Nobody needs to teach churches to go, okay, I should pay attention to what people who are here want. I mean, that's just natural, right? Which is why it's so easy to focus on who we want to keep instead of who we're trying to reach. And churches have been guilty of this. We'll see this in a minute. Churches have been guilty of this from the time Jesus left this earth. But people who are followers of the way learn to prioritize, to put the needs of those who are not Christians above those who are. And the reason that these early followers did this is because Jesus taught and modeled this. I'm not going to take the time to, to go through all this, but you can go home and you can read Luke 15 for yourself. Because in Luke 15, Jesus looked at a group of people and he said, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. Let me translate that for you. When all of us Christians show up at church every Sunday, everybody in heaven goes, I'm glad they're there. They need some work. When somebody who's not a follower of Jesus shows up and decides to become a follower of Jesus, a party erupts in heaven. That's what that means. To which you would go, well, that's not fair. God, you tell me God's focus is, you know, not as much on me as on them. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. God's focus is more on those who are far from him than those who are found. But that makes sense because, well, you're found, you know, you're found. If you have two kids, this has happened to Jen and me, you have two kids and you lose one of them, you don't focus on the one you've still got because they're safe. They've got everything they need. You focus on the one who's lost. That's how it is with God. That's how he operates. That's how he thinks. Which is why when Jesus was about to leave the earth, some of his last words were to his followers, okay, I want you to go, not to stay and kind of huddle up and, you know, make sure you believe all the right things. He said, I want you to go and make disciples, which is another term for followers. I want you to go and make disciples or followers of me throughout all the nations. This is going to be your focus. This is going to be your priority. It's not going to be on you. It's going to be on the people who are far from me. And yet, maybe this will make you feel better because these, of all people, these people should have figured it out and done it right, but they didn't. It was about 15 minutes after Jesus left the earth and they completely forgot about what he said. And they went back to focusing on themselves to the point that for three years, the earliest followers of Jesus, including the leaders like Peter and James and John and Matthew, those guys, they all stayed in Jerusalem. They all stayed with people that were like them. They all stayed in places where they were comfortable. They didn't leave. They didn't go anywhere. And it's like, well, didn't Jesus tell us to go to all the nations? They're like, ah, Jerusalem's far enough. You know, I'm not, I'm not venturing out. They just stayed right where they were. Um, and after about three years, God decided, I'm going to have to give them some encouragement to move, you know, to, to start doing what I asked them to do. And so he allowed a persecution to break out about AD 36. This persecution begins, and if you've ever heard of the Apostle Paul, well, before he was a Christian, Paul was the, the ringleader of this persecution. And they began to arrest Christians and kill Christians and torture Christians, you know, on and on. Not all of them, but enough of them, it got their attention. And so these Christians in Jerusalem just scattered. And they went all over the region. But when they got to their new towns, you can see this in a second, when they got to their new places, guess what they did? 
They were Jewish, so they just hung out with Jewish people. They weren't going to deal with non-Jewish people at all. And they hung out with people who believed like them. They hung out with people who made them comfortable. And nothing, they had dispersed, but nothing really changed in terms of their approach. They still weren't focused on people who were far from God. So, seven years total pass. Okay, four more after this persecution. And something unique happens. And I think this is just my opinion. I think this was God's way of going, okay, I've got to step in and do something to get their attention. I've got to step in and help them to realize I really do mean what I say when I tell them to prioritize people who are nothing like them, who believe in a way totally different than they believe. So here's what happened. I'll give you a little backstory. AD 40, AD 40, Peter, you heard of Peter. Peter is in the coastal town of Joppa. Now Joppa still exists today. If some of you have ever been to Israel, uh, the town's called Jaffa now. So Peter's in this western coastal town of Joppa because the persecution had happened, right? So he'd been dispersed. Now he's living in Joppa. He's staying at the home of a guy named Simon the Tanner and because that was his business, not that he was tan. Anyway, so I just didn't want you to misunderstand. So Simon the Tanner, okay, is housing Peter. And Peter's there and Peter's hanging out with all the Jewish people who are there. There are a lot of them. They're there in Joppa. And Peter's talking about the message of Jesus, but he's only talking about it with people like him. He's only talking about fellow Jewish people. Meanwhile, 32 miles north of Joppa, if you could picture this in your head, there's another town. The town's called Caesarea. And in Caesarea, there lives a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. Now, Cornelius and Peter could not have been any further different than they were. Caesarea had been a Jewish town that the Romans, when they occupied Israel, the Romans had taken Caesarea and they had made it their headquarters. So all of a sudden, all, there was all of this, what the Jewish people would call Gentile influence, non-Jewish influence, pagan influence, that had infiltrated Caesarea. And now there was a huge population of Romans who were living there, including this Roman centurion who was over uh, a guard or, of a hundred different Roman soldiers. So to the Jewish people, Cornelius was the enemy. I mean, he's part of the, the power that stole you know, their freedom from them. So what in the world could Peter and Cornelius have in common? What could, according to Jewish people, what could God possibly want to do with Cornelius? Because Cornelius is part of the enemy. He's, God couldn't love them. Look at what they've done to God's people. This is how the Jewish people viewed it. In their mind, if you met a first century Jewish person, they would have told you we are morally superior to them. We are religiously superior to them. Look at how we behave. Of course, we're morally superior. We're so much better behaved. Look, look at what we believe. They believe in a, you know, a pagan pantheon of gods. We don't believe in all that. We believe in the one true God. We're religiously superior. They just believe they were superior in every way. And they did not. This is not a, a stretch. They did not interact any more than was necessary. So, one day, Cornelius, to the dismay and utter disbelief of all Jewish people, Cornelius is trying to figure out how to better follow God. They didn't even think this was possible. They didn't think God would want anything to do with him. But Cornelius and his family want to follow God. And they're trying to figure it out. The problem is, in Caesarea, nobody who knows how to follow the way of Jesus is willing to explain to them how to follow the way of Jesus because what would Jesus want to do with them? So he's at an impasse. He's at a crossroads. And so an angel shows up. I told you, this is, this is a bit unusual. An angel shows up to Cornelius. And he says, Cornelius, I know you're trying to follow God, and you don't know how. So I've got a plan for you. Go down to Joppa. Send somebody down to Joppa. Go to the home of Simon the Tanner, which is on the sea. And there's a, a man there by the name of Peter. I'm sure Cornelius is like, oh, I've heard of Peter. He says, yeah, yeah, well, he's staying there. I want you to send some people to go get Peter and bring him back. And Peter's going to tell you how to follow Jesus. So Cornelius is all excited, you know. So this is about three in the afternoon. So probably next morning, Cornelius gets up. He takes two servants and a soldier. He gives them their assignment. And he sends them on the 32-mile horseback ride down to Joppa. Meanwhile, God knows I got a real problem because when they show up, Peter's going to look at them and go, uh-uh, ain't no way I'm going with y'all because they didn't want anything to do with each other. Matter of fact, you'll see this in a minute. For Jewish people to interact with Gentile people in this way, well, it, was, it was just absolutely off limits. So God decides he's got to send the message to Peter that he needs to be interacting with these people who are nothing like him. And so Peter has a dream. And in his dream, I won't go into all the details. You can read it for yourself in Acts 10. But in this dream, God basically says to Peter, you know all the things you think were off limits and out of bounds, food you couldn't eat, you know, on and on. 
I want you to eat it. I want you to interact with it. Peter's going, oh, you know God in his dream. He said, oh, you know God, I'd never do that. I'm a good Jewish man. I, I would never do that. And God's going, no, you don't get it. Like, you think you're honoring me by not. I'm telling you that you should. So once Peter begins to understand this, God tells him in this dream, <laughs> uh, by the way, there's a Roman centurion who's sending three guys to come get you. You better go with them. So sure enough, you know, Peter wakes up, whatever, whatever. There's a knock on the door at Simon the Tanner's home. Just like God had predicted, there are these three guys, and they say, Peter, we're supposed to ask you to come with us. And to the shock of everyone in this house, Peter's like, I will go. But Peter's not about to go by himself, so he grabs five or six of his buddies, and he's like, y'all, they're all Jewish, and he's like, y'all are going with me, okay? So imagine this, all six of them headed with the three, you know, Cornelius representatives, 32 miles back to Joppa. And the whole time, I tried to think of, I tried to think of how this um, how to relate this to current day. And I can't think of two groups of people more diametrically opposed to one another than these Jews and Gentiles in the first century. It was such a cultural divide. Maybe for some of you who are older, if you remember back, there's always tension, but if you remember back when there was such tension between the Israelis and the Palestinians and they finally got the leaders to sit down at a table together, maybe that's the closest thing we could come to. Because these people just wanted nothing to do with each other. They never would sit down and have conversations unless absolutely necessary. So Peter and his guys are traveling back and all this stuff's running through their head. Why would God want us to come here? What's the point? We know these people don't follow God. We know they don't care. Why would we leave what's familiar to interact with them? But they go, they go. And when they get there, Cornelius assumes, this gives you a good idea of the culture at the time, Cornelius assumes Peter will never walk into my house. So Cornelius goes outside. He meets Peter. He begins to talk to him. And Peter shocks him and says, no, 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 I'll, I'll go inside. Of course, Cornelius is like, I got, a, I got a house full of people who are waiting to hear how to follow Jesus. Nobody will tell us. Would you, you know, would you tell us? And I guess Cornelius was basically like, if you'll tell me, I'll go tell them, you know, back and forth. Peter's like, no, no, no. So here in Acts 10 is how Luke says it unfolds. He says, while talking with Cornelius, Peter went inside He found a large gathering of people. You you can't imagine how uncomfortable this must have been for everybody. He goes on. Uh, Peter says to him, you are, you imagine this is your opening statement, all right? You're well aware it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. In other words, Peter starts by going, hey, you guys know I shouldn't be here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble back home when I go back home. It's completely against our law because we think you're your filthy dogs. I mean, that's really how they viewed it. We just think you're filthy dogs. So we have a law as Jews that we should never associate or visit people like you. And yet here I am. Well, Peter, why are you here? Peter says, here's why. (laughs) But God, it took God, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Um, Implication, I have been calling all of you impure and unclean. Imagine you come into my house and we sit down and the first thing I say is, you know what, I never thought I'd let people like you in my house because y'all are just the worst. I mean, I can't believe the way you live, but God told me I should just stop talking about how terrible you are. That's how, that's how Peter starts his talk. You can imagine the tension in the room, right? Peter goes on. He says, so when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection, which that's, that's kind, Peter. You didn't raise any objection because God didn't give you an option. Oh, yeah, there was that. But I didn't want to tell him about that, right? I came without raising any objection. And then I love this. He says, may I ask why you sent for me? Now, the reason he asked that question is because Peter and these other Jewish people could not fathom, they couldn't imagine that somebody who was non-Jewish would have any interest in following Jesus. They thought they were so pagan. They thought they were so far gone. They thought, you know, they were so different. Why, why would you ever possibly have an interest in following Jesus? You're, you're so morally inferior to us. I, we don't even think you'd want to adopt the way of Jesus. So Peter's just being as honest here as he can be. Can you tell me why you've got me here? It, it can't be because you want to follow Jesus, but I don't know why else I'm here. Okay. And so Cornelius at this point speaks up again. You can read this for yourself, but Cornelius is basically like, No, 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 we've been trying to figure out how to follow God. Nobody will tell us because nobody will talk to us. So here we are, and I know I'm a Roman centurion. I know we're on the, you know, we're part of the enemy. You know, we're on the other side. 
we're across the lines from you, but listen, we just don't want there to be a line. We, we want to follow the God that you follow. And so when Cornelius gets done explaining all this, here's what Peter says to the entire group. He looks at them and he goes, I now realize how true it is that God doesn't show favoritism. So you thought God showed favoritism, Peter? He's like, well, yeah, of course. I thought God loved us Jewish people way more than all of you. But uh, it's clear now. He doesn't show favoritism. But he accepts from every nation. Oh, yeah, Jesus did tell us when he left we should go to every nation. We just didn't think he really meant that. (laughs) But now it's becoming obvious. Apparently he did. We thought God only loved our nation. We thought God only loved our kind. We thought God only loved the people who were like us, behaved like us, and believed like us, and, you know, dressed like us, and voted like us. And you know, we, We thought God really cared about us more. But apparently, he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And then Peter looks at him and he says, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel. They're going, well, yeah, we've heard about it. We just don't know how to apply it. We don't know what it means. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. And in this moment, Peter's theology, his viewpoint, his perspective is starting to shift. Peter's priority is starting to change. And so I'll let you read the rest of it for yourself. But what Peter does next is he just explains the death and the resurrection of Jesus. He says, yeah, we were there. Jesus died. Roman cross, here's why he died. Three days later, he came back to life. A whole lot of us saw him, saw him at different places and different times. I know that's hard to believe, but I'm telling you, we saw him. You know, he really is alive. And he unpacks exactly what it means to experience forgiveness from God and to follow Jesus. And to the astonishment and amazement of all the Jewish guys with Peter, this entire house of people says, we want to follow. We're in. We believe. We trust. We want that forgiveness. And they all become followers of Jesus in that moment. And you can read this for yourself. It's pretty comical. It says that that this group was astonished that God would forgive these folks. But he had. It messed with their theology, but they're staring there looking at it and they see the reality of it and they go, okay, we can't deny this anymore. We never thought God cared about these people. Now we're realizing maybe he cares about them most. Now you would think that would have changed everything, right, with the early church? It did not. It did not. As a matter of fact, this became one of those things that Peter and his guys went back and they shared. And everybody was like, huh, that's interesting. Well, you know what? If they're going to be part of our group, they need to act Jewish. And so they actually began to try to make it harder on these non-Jewish people. Well, they got to follow our law too, and they got to do this, and they got to do that. And it became such a big point of contention. And Paul, who at one point had been persecuting these Christians, ends up seeing Jesus alive. And he begins to, to side with and to lead the side that says, no, no, no. God, God's opened the door to everybody. The church is open for anybody. And there was so much tension over whether you had to be Jewish to be Christian, be Jewish to be Christian, this, that eight years after this, eight years after this, in about AD 48, they have the first church business meeting. You can read about it in Acts 15. This one was not boring. I've been in a lot of boring ones. I've also been in a lot where they fought and screamed. This was more in the fight screaming side, okay? Because they all got together and they all debated their cases. Do we really want to let these people who are not Jewish into our church or not? And to the credit of these early followers of Jesus and particularly the leaders, their conclusion was, we're not going to ask them to become Jewish. Jesus didn't ask them to become Jewish. We're not going to make it difficult for them to turn to God. And at that point, the doors were flung wide open. Unfortunately, over the last 2,000 years, because it's human nature, isn't it? That gravitational pull has kept taking those of us who are Christians and those of us in our churches back to focusing on ourselves and not prioritizing the people who are furthest from their heavenly father. And when you do that, what happens is you become really judgmental of other people's sin, but hypocritical about your own because you excuse it away. You you end up setting up barriers that are unnecessary and obstacles that are not needed and saying, well, if you really want to be a part of us, you, you can't belong here until you believe this way and until you do this and think like this and act like this and dress like this. And it ends up becoming a closed off system, a closed environment where, you know what, people who are on the outside go, 
I would love to learn about God, but I can't go there to do it because I just don't fit in. They will not accept me. But that is not the way of Jesus and is not what he introduced to the world. It was not his intention for this movement we call the church. So for those of us at Journey, from day one, we've been trying to figure out how to create a church and be a group of people who prioritize the people far from God above ourselves. And as I said, we do not always get it right. But there are three practices we keep coming back to that I want to share with you. Three practices we learn directly from Jesus on how to do this. The first one is this. Jesus leaned relationally in the direction of those he was most unlike, and we should too. When you read the accounts of Jesus' life, you find over and over he spent more time with people who were nothing like him than he did those who were more closely like him. Which means, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, just ask yourself the question. When you look at your circle of influence, when you look at your circle of friends, the people you run with, how many of those people that you have relationships with, that you built friendships with, are different than you? Different in how they believe, different in how they behave, different in how they think about faith or religion or Jesus, different in how they live their lives, different in what they value. See, there's a tendency for all of us just to gravitate to people who are like us. Jesus never did that. He always leaned relationally in the direction of people who were most unlike him because those people needed him. And for you and me, if we're going to be followers of Jesus who actually follow the way of Jesus, we got to be intentional about caring about and loving people that maybe we don't agree and line up with on much of anything. But what we can agree on is that God cares about them. What we can agree on is the fact that God actually may be more focused and concerned about them than he is us. And he's put us in their life for a reason. Which leads to the second point. Jesus was not concerned with guilt by association. And neither should we. This, this trips people up all the time especially Christians. It's like, oh my goodness, I don't want to be friends with those people or hang out with those people or go to those places because if I do, everybody will think I'm, a, I'm approving of what they're doing. Are you kidding me? That's the dumbest logic in the world. You know you can accept people and love people without approving of everything. You do it all the time. If you're a parent, you do it every day with your children. Every day. You do not approve of everything they do. You accept them unconditionally. And oh, by the way, you kids, you do it with your parents every day, don't you? You don't approve of everything, but you accept them. Uncond- we do this all the time. We're not worried about guilt by association. That's, that's just a good excuse to try to justify the fact that we don't care enough to love people who are different than us. Because it's a lot harder to love people who are different than me. But Jesus wasn't concerned by that. He was going to love people different than him, and it earned him, you know, Uncorrectly, incorrectly and unfortunately the reputation of being a friend of tax collectors and sinners and they said it in a demeaning way about him but he didn't care because he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners in other words he was a friend of people who were nothing like him didn't bother him at all which leads to the third thing and that is simply that Jesus didn't expect non-followers to behave like followers and we won't either You don't find one instance where Jesus looks at people who know nothing about God and aren't trying to follow him and go, I can't believe you would make that choice, that you would behave that way, that you would spend your weekend. He didn't do that. Why? Because why would you expect somebody to live up to a standard they don't even agree with? He never expected people who didn't follow him to live and behave like they followed him. No, it was about the relationship first, the behavior and, you know, the lifestyles. That would change over time. So... Here's one, what I want to encourage you to consider. Who has God put in your life? If you're a follower of Jesus, who has God put in your life? Who's far from him? And maybe far from you. Far from you in the sense that they don't think like you, value what you value, do what you do. But who's God put in your life for you to love, for you to accept, for you to point to their heavenly father? Listen, they're there so that you can share with them the love of Jesus. They're there so that you can make an invite. Hey, you should come to church with me sometime. But they're also there so that you can show them what the way of Jesus looks like. And a lot of them are not going to listen to the invitation you have. They're not going to take you up on that until they see you live it out. Until they see, oh my goodness, you just, you forgive more than I would forgive. 
you're more generous and selfless and compassionate and more self-controlled and patient. I don't know how you live that way. When you show the way of Jesus, it earns you the right to share the way of Jesus with people. And listen, there are a lot of people in your life and in mine who it's a struggle. It's dark. It's hopeless. And they look great on the surface, but behind the scenes, everything's a mess. Everything's a mess. And you have no idea how one invitation could change everything for them. You also, as some of us have seen this summer with some of our friendships, you also have no idea how a lack of an invitation can leave them in a place where they're utterly hopeless. And a simple invitation to come and to discover, to come and to see, to come and explore could have changed everything for them. It could change everything for for your friend, if you're willing to make it. Who do you need to invite? Who do you need to love? Who do you need to accept? Who's different than you? Followers of the way, they prioritize people far from God because that's what our Heavenly Father does. So we're going to wrap up here in just a moment with a final song. And the thing I love about this song is it is a challenge for those of us who follow Jesus to live that way, to live the Jesus way, to bring hope to people who are hopeless, to shine a light in people who can't find the light. They just feel like it's dark around them. To offer forgiveness in ways that doesn't make sense to the normal person. It's an invitation and a challenge for us to do that so that they can see Jesus in and through us. And we can share Jesus, not just by how we live, but in the invitations that we make. If you're not a follower of Jesus, just know we don't want anything from you. This is what we want for you. We want you to know that you have a heavenly father who loves you so much. They'd give everything for you. Would you stand with me and let's pray, then we'll sing. Father, it's just our nature. It's so normal and natural for us to just gravitate to people like us. It's a lot easier to love people who love us, to like people who are like us. But I bet for every one of us in this room, there are some folks who you placed in our lives and they're they're not like us at all. They're far from us. And if we're honest, we probably get uncomfortable when we're around them. We get annoyed when we're in conversation because they just value things so differently than we value them. But that is not your way and that is not your heart. So would you help us to demonstrate that, to model what it looks like, to live out, to point to the Jesus way. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you'd like more content like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel and download our Journey app to access all of our recent message content. And our app is the easiest way to share this content with a friend. For more information on our church or to find our app or our YouTube channel, just visit journeycalway.com. That's journeycalway.com. Thanks for listening.